Welcome people, welcome back. It's time for some relaxed evening coding. Cheers. So what is up? Tell me what's up. I can tell you what's up here. So in the previous stream, uh, we started to implement our own unit test framework because um, Google test is a flaming dumpster fire, as I found out, that completely ruins my compiled times and um, causes insane code bloat and so we will do something more reasonable and that does exactly what we need and my goal is to finish this today so far that I can convert all my unit tests to this new framework and have and and enjoy much faster compile times and um, much more reasonable uh, file sizes and so on So currently I'm working on some simple stuff um, like having a summary report at the end, how many tests passed and so on. So we write the number of past tests and if we have some fails oh, and fail to call it. I actually want to have a specific list of the failed tests. So I think the easiest thing will be to run this run this loop twice. If we have failed tests, because then we can print. Actually, I want the indent here also. I always give some indent string to my output functions. <clears throat> so let's print in this case. Actually, first let's put a new line separator. And then let's just print. <clears throat> So here, uh, indent. I actually also want a list of the unknown tests if we have any. Usually we should not have tests with unknown status, but um, let's be careful.
We will later introduce some nice color to that because that's a feature of Google Test that I like, the colored output. That's very motivating for me and um, also gives a very quick visual indication if things are fine. I like to see green. Sometimes I also like to see red. Depends. So, actually, let us calculate the unknowns once and for all here. Then we can make this simpler. Same here. One of tests, okay, one of, one of, yeah. That, that looks good. I think I want to have a clear indicator in the very last line. So probably the new line before and then a very clear indicator. Oh, actually, yeah, I need I need a second new line because I have not put the new line here. And let's print. So if we have failed tests, then it is clear that we print fail. Otherwise, if we have unknown tests, um, let's print some question marks. And otherwise we print OK. So this is visually very different than, than fail. <coughs> That's why I like pass and fail both in, in uppercase letters not so much because they are visually not that easy, easily um, differentiable. So let's see. Or did I actually call it? Yeah. Actually, the listing I think we do no longer need. And also, we I think we, we still have some debug prints here. Signal called. We can can leave this in. Running test is okay. This is something um, that we will still need to deal with, or not need, but I want to deal with it. Currently, if we hit an award, we get this dialog box, which also, I mean, it would be nice if it had to try to debug. Okay, so we have the opportunity to debug, which is not the worst thing, but I'm not sure we always want that. So, failed tests, okay, none are listed, zero of two tests passed, two of two tests failed, but the listing did not really work. And then we print fail and it's missing a new line at the end. So, 
So why did the listing not work? Ah, because we did not, I think we did not reset the node pointer, that's why. So in order that this, this does not happen again to us, we will actually put this in a nested scope here. So the, sorry, so the node pointer goes out of scope and we cannot forget to start it again. We could also convert this to a for loop, that's probably even better. And then we can use continue and so on. Yeah, I think I like that better. Makes it also less easy to forget these things. And a bit more compact. Better. I always forget that it's called M next. So let's see. We get the failure report. It looks nice. Zero of two tests passed, two of two tests failed. Okay, number of test fails. This is just being unregistered. This is stuff we do no longer need, I think, because we know this works. Uh, for the unregistering, we actually should think about If we need that at all, I'm not sure if we need to unregister. I'm actually not sure if I want to keep this global or if we move everything into the registry. Would make it probably easier if we go multi-threaded at some point to have one registry a thread, for example, or something like that. I'm not sure. So, now for the fun thing. I want some colors. I want colors in my report. And on Windows, this is actually quite a pain, it seems. So on Unix, this would be simple. You just emit some escape sequences and you get your colored output. No problem. <clears throat> um, they added this in Windows 10, but here on, on, on Windows 7, and as long as this machine doesn't break, I will be on Windows 7. So let us do the Windows 7 thing. We need some API calls. Set console text attribute. So <clears throat> I actually Googled something nice. So somebody wrote this very small and nice tool. Nice to see such clean and small and compact code. Very cool. Um, and this is actually what this guy wrote is um, a, a converter that converts unc sequences into API calls that switch the colors. And we will just, um, we will just need to to do the the most simple th things. So there is one call for getting uh, the current console settings. I am not sure if we will need that. What we definitely will need is to get the handle for the console. 
So con is a handle. But before we do that, um, let's actually think about how we want to the internal interface that we want to have because at some point we will want to run these things on um, Linux or, or Unix like <coughs> operating systems like, like Mac OS for example and then we will want to do the, the escape sequences so we should build ourselves um, so an interface that allows us to, to encapsulate the knowledge about how to do these things nicely. So I think, I think what I would like to have is here in test, maybe, maybe even public in test because this could be useful also for the for the unit tests themselves um, have something like <clears throat> like test printf <clears throat> the question is do we want to specify the file handle here because for the console, it doesn't make sense anyway to specify the, <coughs> the file handle. But still, it makes our <coughs> interface probably more powerful. If we do it like this, and then uh, we would put, we would um, pass in some color information. Question is, what is the what is the most general way to do this? Because okay, we have a we have a spammer to ban here, but I cannot do this here. I always forget that I need to do it here. No, nobody here wants to become famous. So I am banning you a letter to. A letter to. Bye bye, scum of the earth. So, um, if we think about true color terminals, we could have three bytes color for foreground and background, it is six bytes, and maybe some attributes. So maybe we pass attributes in like this, or should we pass them in a struct? I don't know. Let's try this. Simple. So, actually, hmm. I really would would like to have some test context. Anyway, that is maybe something I want to have because um, now I'm thinking about the following. We ran into this problem already for the test macros because for the test assertion, it's the question, if it wants to report a failure, where does it go to report the failure? And as long as the test assertions are directly inside the test functions. It's no problem because the test functions now have an argument current test that they can use. And you have no trouble, you don't need any thread local storage to get it if you are multi-threaded or anything. Uh, and 
The question is now what, what if you recurse into other functions inside of your test functions and then usually what the test systems have is they have some kind of singleton instance that you can get and you can address everything to it. Actually I think what I will like even more is one one um, context argument that is simply passed on because I mean when I'm writing unit tests I know that the test is within the unit test um, I anyway I do not want to have functions that do not look like test functions but they have test insertions inside them I don't want any any kind of that so this this argument could also signal very clearly that we are dealing that we are dealing uh, with a test context uh, uh, with a function that is run in a test context. So let's make everything explicit. I'm always I'm always for making things explicit. We will have a test context um, structure. This will be the first argument to our test functions and maybe the only one because they can get the rest. Yeah. I, I'm tempted to call it TC because I usually use very brief names for these standard arguments that all the functions get. I'm just thinking that maybe if we ever make this into a reusable library, it is probably better to be a bit more explicit in the name. So that will be our, our thing. Every, everything gets this test context and not the individual stuff. I think I actually like that idea a lot. Uh, the test context will have um, I actually don't know if I really want to use this m underscore crappy convention for C++ I always use it I always use it for things that have constructors and stuff because then you have this problem that you if you as as, well, as soon as you're object oriented you have this problem that you you always want to have the arguments named the same as the data members and that's causing problems and so you make this m underscore for the data members which kind of makes the explicit this pointer kind of useless because if you have a prefix you could just prefix them with the this pointer also so I don't know this these are things I always worry about because I don't like these prefixes very much I must say let's try to go without them for the text context so uh, test we will have a registry hanging around we will have a current test that is actually represented by the registrar And I think that's it. And maybe we want to have so, some kind of impl some kind of impl pointer that is so a struct that is forward declared here.
So maybe we want to have that to, to hide some details inside. Not completely sure about that. Uh, will this give problems with the impel? Recurrent details. I'm not sure if this is a good idea to do it like this, but this is an attempt to keep the header file clean of, let's, for example, Windows specific stuff because sorry um, in this test context emperor we will actually here we would keep the handle for for the console for example i think because we don't want to get this every time newly and this is something I wouldn't really like to I wouldn't really like to export this to the header so to make our test header depend on a Windows API header that's ugly that's why I want to hi hide these things in the in the impl detail structure okay that's it That said, the run registered tests will probably, should this create the context or, no, the main function, the main function will create the context. This actually is something we will also move to the framework but this will create the um, test context and this will be passed here Now, um, how to build the implementation details? Especially how to do it without dynamic memory allocation. We could make it that this main function, that this main function actually knows, knows about the implementation detail. It should not be a problem because, because we will move this into the test.cpp in the end anyway. So it should not be a problem to have a text test context um, input here and just set the pointer in test context to point to this so we don't need any dynamic memory allocation sorry And so we now we pass to every function that we call we pass this nice test context. Uh, this is something we will now get rid of.
we'll do something like this probably. So let's everywhere add this test context. So let's implement this later. Sorry for miscompleting. I will fix the comma later. And the test printf will now also get this context. Everything will get the context. That's very nice. Actually, this this jump out of test, this will move into the context. This is much cleaner to have this in the context. Actually, maybe even in the context, context details. Uh, let's not have this here. Let's put this in the implementation details. Okay, the signal handler is really the only thing, the only thing to which we cannot pass a pointer. So here we will need some kind of singleton mechanism, but we will need it only very locally. I mean, we could do, there is a trick that you could do by generating the signal handler code. We could try that. We could try to generate some code. That would be fun. <clears throat> Let's try that. Because what we want to have, we want to have a signal handler that gets a test context object passed, something like this. Uh, let's make it unusable for now. And we want to call this, here actually we want to do the long jump, then here we have the context, that's very nice. Sorry, that's complete garbage, what I wrote. That is what we want. So here it's no problem, but here in the in a normal signal handler, we do not have the context information. So let's pretend, um, let's pretend that we have it.
and I will show you soon what I want to achieve with this. I have no idea if this will work or if some non-execute bit will kill us or anything. So, but let's just do all the other stuff we need. So, we will definitely need something to initialize the context. Actually, actually, this will be a public, public thing, I think. Text context init. Test context pointer. We will actually assert here that the details pointer is already set. So this is a precondition here. We will do this in our main function. <coughs> First, let's. No, we cannot zero. We can zero the detail struct. Yeah, I really would like a shorter parameter name, but yeah, that's for now. We will both Actually, we don't need that. Let's zero it. Then let's get the console handle. This is what I actually, in the beginning, I wanted to do. How is it called? Get standard handle, standard output handle. Get standard handle. Standard output handle. Let's check if this can fail. This can probably fail, I guess. Standard input output return value if the function su succeeds. Yeah. Ba, ba, ba. Yeah, I can return null or oh, invalid handle value. Okay. So both are both are error cases. That's also why I, I write explicitly equals null here because usually I don't do that. I just use the Boolean uh, evaluation. But as we have these two specific cases here, Is exit actually is is this one always valid or should you use the exit failure? Hmm. 
Yeah, we should use the exit failure. Okay, and now I actually want to have a clean Windows API error message here. I already have a function that does this. Where is it? I think it's in the PDF parser. Fail Windows system error. We cannot really reuse it because it does something slightly different because it uses the status error reporting system that we don't have here in the test code. But, but we will... So let's put this in imper here. So the status we do not have. I think we don't really need the variable arguments here. By the way, this is something we will need. We will definitely need the standard argument server here, but not for this function. Error is last error, that is fine. Okay, here we need a here here we need a buffer. Let's make this a kilobyte or something. This will become a bit simpler. So buff size is size of buffer. And we take care to make it not larger than 65K because the format message does not like it if it happens. It, anyway, here it won't happen. So I think we can uh, leave all of this the same. Then Actually, we might want to check the result. I don't really do that. Okay, error case is result is zero. So we should zero the buffer before, I guess. It's safer. So
Uh, let's check the error case again of this function because I want to be clean in the error cases. Format message. Return value, where do we have it? If the function fails, the return value is zero. Okay, we don't get any. <laughs> we don't get any else. I mean, what we, we can assert that this must always be smaller than size of buffer. Because it's either zero in the error case or the number of characters written without the terminating zero. Let's only write as we put as um, Let's do it like this. That's it. I hope that this is a clean implementation of printing an error message from the Windows API. Now, where, where was I? Where was I? I think here. Yeah, so we print. Uh, failed and then we print the we actually print just like this and then we print the Windows system error we probably should should pass it the file pointer and replace standard error file to be a bit more flexible here <clears throat> okay so now if these both did not hit uh, we have a valid console handle that's great should we release this handle at the end I have no idea It doesn't say here that we should release it. Okay, we also have an error device. That could be interesting, but I don't know if the colors, how the colors work with respect to these two devices. I have no idea. Um, Let's, for the time being, implement this very simply. We do a vf printf to file format and vl. And so far we ignore the attributes. We will fill this in later. We need to get things compiling and so first. And we need to do this trick with the signal handler. That will be interesting. <clears throat> List traces to test. Yeah, we can leave this alone. We will later everywhere use our own print function, I think. Which probably means we can put the indent into the context. What we definitely need to do we 
we definitely need to set some things here so the result is unknown then in the test context we set the current test to node what else do we set the registry I think we can in the end get rid of this variable here do we need to set anything else Resident details or this set okay and then we pass the test context and nothing else there will be so many problems when we compile this but we have to get started so let's hit all the syntax errors we made yeah i did not only miss misspeak i also mistyped Okay, in the macro, the macro, we do not use this test context, current test and result. Also here the global, this global will go away. We will do everything via the context that is cleaner. That is cleaner. Okay, uses undefined struct because we are here. Okay, we are. Yeah, this is the point where we will need to clean this up. What we actually want to do here is to call our test test main. And we will actually do it like, I think we will do it like, like Google test does. This is, I think, one of the things they do right is that they they parse the arguments they understand and if they don't understand something they leave it in the array for the main function to parse by itself so this is something we will also do and actually we should have an init function here and then a main function uh, let's keep things simpler for the time being and just have the main function and this will actually only take the arc c because yeah and then we can make later we can split this up in init and run or something that we can put some custom code in between if you want So test main. And here this should be no longer an unknown forward declared structure because here we know here we know all the details. Just need to export the prototype.
Okay, this is again the win API min function that messes us up here. Okay, and this min is an algorithm which is a bit overkill. So maybe maybe it would be better off maybe we would be better off to use the win API min macro than this. Do we need, I don't think we need a, because this will handle errors, which we should actually, should do here. Test context. Hmm. The question is where do we store the number of failed tests or anything? Where should we store it? it seems like a registry thing. To me, I think I will actually get rid of this numbers in here. Should we have the number of fails in the registry is the question. Okay, we initialize with zero, that's fine. Then we do not need this test failures anymore. I'm, I don't like this so much, but we will clean this up later. Test trailer, so it's initialized. Um, we can use it here. CPP line 23. Um, ah, yeah, yeah, I know what it is. That is in the signal handler. In the signal handler, I put an assert. But what I actually want to look at now is something completely different because I want to look at the generated code for, for this function here. So let's take a look at that. And then let's do something very evil that might work or not. So, out debug, debug, CMake files.
We need this one, test input signal handler. Very nice, that is exactly what I wanted to have. This is what we need. The question is just if we will completely mess up all the calling conventions. <laughs> Let's just try if this crazy idea will work. Only thing is, I need to check something. Oh, but this is fixing the album size for me, call. Wow, this is complicated. Has been a long time since I assembled instructions by hand. E, what is the E8? Core near relative. Displacement relative to next instruction. Oh, this one, okay. Yeah, this we cannot really, we, we need something like this. Okay, I need a slightly different, I need a slightly different code here because because we need to load this from a function pointer. This is getting a bit more involved than I would have hoped for.
this will crash now. But that's not the point. Yeah. Of course it crashed. Because we jumped to address zero. That's not so good. But what we want to have actually is the code. FF15, is this the one we want? Probably. I hope it is this one. Cornea absolute indirect address given. This is the one we want to have. 15, 1, 2, 3, 4, and this is probably this keyword pointer. Let's hope. People, let's hope that this is what we are looking at. So we again, we load the address into the CX register. So we are doing so crazy stuff. Now let's run in here. doing crazy stuff. So I guess we don't need alignment on this architecture. So what I'm doing now, what I'm doing now is terribly, terribly architecture dependent, of course, and might fail anyway. But it's fun to try. Let's have some fun, because why not? So this is offset zero, this is offset five. So here we have little NDN test context pointer. Wait. Why? Why is this? Oh, I was stupid. I made this too small. I made this too small. So that's not the code we want. <laughs> this is this is becoming a real rat hole. A fun rat hole.
so let's crash again. How does the code look like? That's more like what we want. And now we are not at five here, but four more. No, six more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So five more. I'm still not happy. Still not really happy. Because this is too short. How can this be so short? Is it because the data segment is small enough? Let's look at this in a deeper way. Okay, but this is actually
has to be this RM64, right? CE64. Is this relative? Let's calculate. Is this relative? Yes, it is relative, relative to the core instruction. Smart. It is relative to the core instruction. Okay, now I think we have finally the info we need. So this is Crazy stuff. So finally, this will become the test context. Little Indian. And cast to event eight. Mm, let's do a Vim macro. No, that was wrong. Okay. Okay. These are actually wrong. This is what we need. Almost. So, that is the move instruction. And now
at this time I really am doing this just because I know better it will work. <laughs> I mean, if it works, it's rather clean. It's totally architecture dependent, of course, but it will be rather clean because we will not need any global variable that could be not thread safe or anything. So the relative address is the address of the function pointer which we will also put here Let's not put the name here to make this less confusing. So the relative address is the address of test convert details signal handle function. minus the address of handle code 10. That's the core instruction. Craziness. Craziness. We are cheating, cheating code just to stuff an argument to a badly designed function. And in the end, maybe we will be thwarted by a no execute bit or something stupid like that. If so, we will just make a quick workaround, get on with the other stuff and handle this and deal with this at another time. And here we will finally do it. Now oh, actually let's Let's do the stupid function pointer cast. That might work or not. And let's pass it on the address. Actually, we, it's an array, so it auto addresses. I'm getting the feeling that we will crash so hard. We are going to crash so hard with that, I think.
Okay, cannot cast from a data point to a function point, I guess. Well, I can't cast from an array, at least it does not auto cast, it seems. So we crashed. That is not a big surprise. Still, still, let's debug a bit. Okay, this looks like it's not initialized. Did we never call the init? <clears throat> we never called the init. So actually we can get rid of this, we can get rid of this. This, get rid of this. We did not call the init. Then, of course, we must crash. Okay, we still crash. So let's debug. Okay, now we have, it is at least initialized. Let's see if we can get some disassembly there. Oh, we did not set this. We did not set the function pointer, did we? Did we not set the function pointer? Ah, uh, this is disappointing. We still crash. We still crash. There is something wrong. Let's see, what do we have at this address? <laughs> we cannot do, oh, we cannot do eight bytes. Okay, at least that. Uh, 
Okay, that does not look good. That does not look good. Test context details. 1FF798. This is correct. This is correct. This is not correct. 96. What is the correct what is the correct one? It is the address of this one, signal handler FM. Let's evaluate that. Text context details signal handler FM. 1FF790. This is six bytes too high. Aha, uh -huh. so it's probably relative to the following instruction, not to the call. Not to the call. I'm not up to date with my instruction set knowledge, sorry. Still not working. That is not such a lot of fun as I wanted to have. Uh, let's look at this again. We see address randomization taking place. So the text context this is correct. This is the address of the text context. This now, I mean it Looks fine. It looks fine. Let's break here. Yeah, I think I think that's the new execute bit, right? Because this is exactly the location where we put the code. Access valuation executing location.
I actually don't know how to get, how to allocate Okay, we need to do, <laughs> we need to red hole deeper. We need to virtual lock something. <laughs> this is getting really a, a deep, deep red hole, but I'm learning a lot. And I hope if somebody is watching, also you are learning something, namely how to write a JIT compiler under Windows, a tiny, tiny JIT compiler. This will be fun. I never use this function, but it's a very interesting function because you can use it for other tricks that you can do. So let's Let's allocate some virtual memory. Okay, this is rounded up for us to page boundary. So the only thing we need is we will actually put this in a separate struct. And let's actually put the code first. Let me just quickly check something. Wow, I have a huge delay in the stream. Why is that? Still seems to be there, but um, the delay is strong with us.
Okay, I think we, we want to have a mem commit and mem reserve. I think we want execute read write. So No, we still fail.
We still fail. But at least we could allocate this thing. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. That was just a stupid mistake. It worked. The only reason why it didn't, it did not really work, is because after the call, after the call, we crash because we don't have a return in place. But this is something we can fix, I think. This is something we can fix. C3 should be C3 should be enough. zero Okay, not yet do we mess up the stack somehow, but at least we get inside here. So that's already great. So we can actually break, break there. <laughs> People, I did not expect this crazy, crazy red hole today, but that happens. So we correctly get here. Is it actually the long jump that crashes us? Yeah. <clears throat> Is the test context address wrong? Let's find out. Something is not quite right yet. But we already have cheated code being correctly executed. <laughs> that is such a lot of fun. 
we should actually make a note which are free later. That is fun. We do in it the long jump here. So let's deeper this some more. We should first reach this. First we should set up the jump. Yeah, there is something being initialized. So test context is at 1EF798, 1EF798. One EF seven nine eight, that's fine. We do get the correct context. Do get the correct context. Maybe we made some, maybe it's because we did not, did not create a valid stack frame or something. Deep in the standard runtime, probably we have no source. No idea what is going on here. Just want to see where we crash. Hotel unwind stop. That does not sound too bad. So it could be just that our stack frame is not a valid x64 stack frame. That that is the reason that the long jump crashes. Let's see what happens if we don't do the long jump. If we get a correct return happening.
Okay, we also screw up something. Yeah, I think that we, this will need some more work. We could just try one thing. We could turn the call into a jump. Probably need something like this. Hmm. So we have uh, is this the model RAM or this, this notation? I don't remember this, what this notation exactly means. It's something that is in the next byte, I think. Part of the next byte. So we have four instead of, four instead of two. Okay, so it's the middle part, three, three through five, three through five. Three through five. No, three is zero. That's the highest one of the five. One, three, four, five. That's a two, yeah. And the jump has a four, I, I think, right? Jump has a four. So we could change that. To two five, I guess.
<laughs> it works, people. <laughs> this is so great. It works. Let's celebrate with a glass of water, whole lane. I think I need to get myself some proper celebration liquid <laughs> because this is the successful bottom of the red hole. <laughs> we chitted a stop for calling a signal handler. How cool is that? People, how cool is that? And I never cheated for x64 before. I mean, I was working on a chit compiler a long time ago, but it was not for x64, if I remember correctly. <laughs> this is so cool. And then we actually don't need the uh, we don't need the return. I can make this 16 sized. <laughs> this is so crazy. Found a board test. It's working and we now have a way to <laughs> everything to avoid the ugly singleton we do everything to avoid it Craziness, machine dependentness, or dependence, I should say. But better than OS dependent. Yeah, I mean, it's OS dependent also because we use the virtual lock, right? We should, still should do the virtual free. But first, and this will not be the next thing we do because it's boring. The next thing we do are some pretty colors. So let's let's display this nice little cheat code that we did. And let me let me take a short break and I'll be back soon with some celebration liquid. And I came back with some appropriate liquid for celebrating our red hole success. Cheers. So to summarize, this is a trick you can use if you have to work with a library that is, has a badly designed callback, like the CSNumNot library here. This signal handler callback is badly designed because it does not take any opaque pointer. So you should always, if you design a callback, it should always take at least one opaque pointer. And this doesn't do it. I actually don't know what the parameter is that it gets, or if it's something like the signal number or something, but it's it's definitely too small for a pointer. And this is really bad design. You should never design your callbacks like this. They should always have this opaque pointer parameter. But if they don't have, you, 
are still not out of luck because you can do the trick that we did today. You can cheat yourself a stop, uh, so a little function code that just has embedded in it uh, the correct pointer and that then jumps to your fixed address uh, callback function that takes the pointer. So that's what we did here. Craziness. I need to sort my liquids here. Too many liquids. So now for something more relaxing, now that this stuff works. I'm actually quite surprised that the virtual lock right away did the right thing and worked perfectly. That's really funny. Okay. Let's do some colors. So the first thing we will do is that we will convert our test code to use this printf function. So let's look at the printfs we have. We can even convert this one. because now we have the test context. That's nice. Um, this one, should we convert this one? I think we should not convert this one because the color printing code will actually call Windows API function and might fail. So we do not want to touch this one, I think. I think all the the normal error message is when something in the API doesn't work, we do not touch. Uh, this, I mean, this one, yeah, no, we could do, but we don't. But these ones are the ones we convert. So let's put this in a register. Um, Let's put this in a register. Yeah, the indent is something that we might put into the context later. No, I don't know Win anymore. So many printers, I should have made a win macro. I can still make one. Okay, I should make I should have made the macro earlier.
Okay, this is probably too early. So we need a prototype for this. And what is the problem here? Conversion not possible. Have we Oh, yeah, sure, attribute. So far we have not yet put the attribute, so let's make another win macro. So we need to go forward to the second comma. No, how does this work? Uh, 2f, ah, yeah, 2f comma, 2f comma, attribute 0, and then search for the next f print f. Vim macros are so cool. I don't need no stinking IDE with refactor when I have Vim macros. Okay, things are still working. And now I want to print my fail in color. Let me just think about how to do that. I want here red, green or cyan or something. So let's define some text attributes. Hmm, how should we call them? I'm not sure if this attribute business that we are doing here is a really good idea. Let's do it, yeah, straightforward. We might adapt the values later to make the code simple. But Okay, <clears throat> and here is actually now the place where we need to set we need to set some attributes. If there is an attribute, first thing is probably we want to flush everything. Also afterwards, I guess. And then we want to set some text attribute, set console text attribute. The 
the handle we should have test context details console handle w attributes um okay foreground token blah 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 Blue, I guess. I guess something like that. This really reminds me of the old times. Doing MS DOS programming. Doing character character based applications. You probably also want some intensity, foreground intensity. And then at the end we want to reset the attributes, but first we must get them. Actually, if, if some of this stuff fails, we probably should not really exit, but just print without colors, I guess. I don't know. Get console screen buffer info. SBI console screen buffer info. Let's first be paranoid, I don't know. So what is this SBI? It has W attributes. Let's put this outside. Let's restore the attributes here. I 
Uh, one thing I want to do is I want to check if we actually have a console handle, otherwise we won't do this stuff. Oh no. Wrong completion. And wrong key. Result is undeclared because I did not declare it. That's why. That is why. Fail! We have a red fail, people. That is so nice. Cheers for fail. Okay, so let's, let's now play with stuff. Now it gets fun. We want to have so many things colored. I want to have this knob. This is a bit stupid now, but I want to have this colored. Maybe we should have I mean we could have built ourselves some special markers into the format string, but then we need to implement VF printf or something like that by ourselves. Or we could first print to a buffer and then do the buffer and read some markers. Maybe that's maybe that's a good idea. Maybe maybe that is a good idea because this is going to be quite a nuisance. Because what I'm thinking of is let's undo this stuff. What really would be nice would be to do something like this. This we want in red and so on. Red, we would do back to normal and so on. Red, back to normal, something like that. <clears throat> we could actually then also print attributes into the string first. Should we do something like that? That would make it so much easier to print nice stuff. Why not do it? Why not? Shouldn't be too hard. The only problem is, only real problem is, so this we will leave like it is.
I don't know a good name, but um, the Renita VSN printf. The only problem is that we don't know the buffer size. That's always the that's always the stupid thing. But we can make VSN printf find it out for ourselves. So find it out. VSN printf. This is not ca called alloc A. Okay, that's not standard. That's not standard. I mean, we could just we could just. Just malloc it. I somehow lost something here. VSM print F I need. Can we pass null for the buffer to only find out the length? We pass n zero. I would because first I would I would pass like this and then format vl and and so in this way we get we get the number of characters. And then we memoc one more than that. Then we print it again, again. Hello, unpronounceable uh, chat person. <laughs> Welcome. If you join now, you missed the best stuff. You missed our cheating adventure. You should rewatch that later. Now we are just doing some colorful printing. That's lame compared to what we did earlier. So we print it to the buffer and if we are still sane, actually let's, let's do that. If we are still sane, then result should now be, 
Actually, it should be equal exactly to n characters. Sorry. If not, there's something really wrong. So now we have the buffer. So now let's let's go through the buffer in the old-fashioned way with a pointer. How would you convince a developer to make tests? Hmm. Good question. Um, tests, tests are a complicated topic because the first question is, should you convince a developer to make tests? And my, so, I, I think about it in, in the following way that um, as an engineer it is and, and I see pro developers and software engineers as engineers and as an engineer it is your uh, duty to to really know what your stuff is doing and the only way to find out is to test um, so in the end, in the end, you, I mean, you basically have no choice but but to test. How? I mean, you could you could make the customer your tester. That's what what many people do. But that's really automated tests. Yeah. You know what, what, what for me is a convincing argument is that it is actually, if you do it right, it's very motivating. So I really like to, I like to compile my code early, I like to run my code early. And tests are really the way for me to do, um, to get the motivation to see things turning from red to green. So um, I, I cannot keep up motivation when I code for a long time without executing stuff. And, but this still does not fully answer your question because then people might say, yeah, why not just try out the code? Why write self-checking tests? Hmm. And it is a good question because, I mean, yeah, exactly, as you say, um, and do manual tests. Uh, the thing is, if people question whether they should write automated tests, they kind of have a point because these automated tests, the self-checking tests, they do have disadvantages. And we should never forget this as engineers, that everything has advantages and disadvantages. Um, and I, I mean, I believe in a lot of advantages of automated tests. Um, because I see tests a bit like if you're climbing in the mountains, you, you use these safety devices um, in order not to fall down a very far distance. So you always, it's like a ratchet. You, you make a little step up and you can only fall a little distance down. You cannot uh, fall to your death if you use these safety devices and tests are a little little bit like these ratchets. So the, the productive code and the tests, they, um, they take care of each other and you always bump up one of them. And um, I'm actually not a climber myself, but, um, but I see it like a bit like this climbing. So it's like a team well, uh, two partners climbing and you either notch up the tests or you notch up the application and that uh, keeps you from, from falling down. But the problem is that you also can invest a lot of work along a certain direction and um, this, this kind of ratchet construction, this consumes a lot of energy that in, in developing and 
uh, can also make you less flexible if you need to refactor or change a lot. So it's, it's really difficult, your question, how to convince someone to test because there are advantages and disadvantages and you need a lot of experience to make the right decision what to test at which level. Um, there is not one answer that you can say, okay, you always should write unit tests because that solves all your problems. It's not like this because the unit test also must be maintained and that's a huge amount of work. Uh, so you should be very judicious about at which interfaces you want to test. I think one thing that you can definitely say, all your interfaces that go out to the customer need automated tests. There's absolutely, I don't think there's any way around it. So that in the interface that you present to the customer, whoever your customer is, this interface needs to be tested in an automated way because otherwise you have no way to make reliable releases. Uh, I, I don't think there's any argument against that. Anything else is actually negotiable. So the testing of any internal interface is, is negotiable and it should be, should be very carefully considered. What are the advantages of testing this interface? What are the disadvantages? Um, and of course, within your organization, you might again have relationships like a developer and customer so that um, one part of the organization uh, presents an interface to another one and then you might have the same uh, or similar considerations with, with testing. But I think if you cannot convince a developer to test the interface that is presented to the to customer, then you should fire the developer because this person has no idea about software at all. Um, everything else, you need to discuss it and make proper engineering decisions about the benefits and the costs. It's really not any ease, easier than that, I'm afraid. So that would be, be my take on it. Um, I don't know if that helped in any way, but the problem is in engineering, basically the answer to every generic question is it depends. <laughs> it depends on so much stuff, what the answer is. The only thing I really believe is what I told you that if it's an interface going outside, there's no way um, around automated testing. And I think actually that one reason that so many modern GUI applications are so bad is that it's probably because GUI testing is hard and a lot of effort and hard to automate and so on and it's often not done. I think that's at least one of the reasons I think why, why GUI applications are often so bad as they are. Uh, time executing. I'm not sure if I know what you mean by time. <clears throat> so let's try to write this function. So what we want to do is we want to react to certain um, certain codes. Yeah, GUI tests are, are time consuming, yeah, yeah. I actually, I must say, I don't have a lot of experience in the GUI area because I mostly worked in embedded systems. Um, 
where testing is much easier than at the GUI, I think, but it also has its own problems because you have very limited systems often. Um, it's often difficult because the system itself is sometimes not powerful to actually support, for example, a test harness or something like this. But so you have your own kinds of problems, but um, yeah. I don't know how to design my codes here, but I think I will, let's just try opening them with a brace. So this is the start of a formatting code. So how do we, how do we read the code? I think, okay, one thing that we definitely want to have is we know the number of, re of remaining characters. So we know that n characters, n characters are remaining. That's important because then we can say if n characters is at least four and mem compare p red zero and then we have a a red formatting code for example So So this is not is it 6 I don't this is not the nicest thing we are doing here now but it will do the job One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, that is okay. This is a bit stupid what we're doing here. We will do it a nicer way later with a kind of table probably or something. Um, we consume, also we consume the characters. Uh, let's also do science so we can do what we wanted to do. Yeah, too much redundancy here. You so see that we have the five here, the five here, and the five characters here. So redundancy, not so good, but it's quite local. So it's, it's not so bad. Actually, know that the place came before.
Okay, so I know my next attribute. I also should make myself a pointer where the where the section started. Um, so and where where the section ended. Probably. Okay, so what else do we need to do? If if the next attribute is different from the current one, we know that we um, print the characters we had so far. Actually, actually, I think we we always need to do this Oh, oh, it's not a problem because we can modify the buffer is ours. The buffer, the buffer is ours. So we can see you later, unpronounceable person. <laughs> Thank you for dropping by. We can actually replace the brace by a terminating zero. That's not the problem. That is not the problem. This is something we do support. Uh, escaping we will deal with later. This is taking a bit more time than I wanted to have, but I'm getting a bit tired, so I'm getting slow and so to keep things simpler let's actually allocate two bytes more and let's put a formatting code an empty one at the end So we don't have to special case the end. And that's it. Is it it? I mean, it could be. 
but this already works. It could be that it works. We don't need a, a, a draw here. So we restarted the variable argument list, that is fine. Um, yeah, maybe it works. It's no beauty, but it might do the trick <laughs> if it would compile. But it doesn't compile because I always make syntax errors. Um, mem compare, that is correct. It also takes a length, and this is our next our next redundant length. This is really ugly, this needs to change, but let's get things going first. This is so ugly. If this works, we will immediately change this crap. Next attribute, did we not this declare? Uh, next. Okay, we we are missing a brace or thumb something. This is the while. What's going on? Where are we missing a brace or whatever? What is going on? Local functions. Mm. 306, this is a very helpful message. Oh, they are right. Why did we lose that? Is that? Oh, this one. <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost. We had, yeah, the start, I did not reset the start. So after we have this part. That's one thing to do. Yes, that's what I want to see. Two of two tests failed and so nicely covered. You got to love it. <laughs> Hi, Christian. Um, <laughs> if you look at my, my rant that I posted to YouTube, you will know what, what really made me quite upset. That is the, the horrible code that is produced if you compile Google test, unit tests, because I had huge problems with compile times yesterday and then I noticed that that uh, the generated code was growing like crazy and I, I took a look of it, at it and I just, I was blown away by the, by the huge amount of code that was generated by the Google test uh, template magic. And so I decided to roll my own thing my own test framework and I challenged myself to make it in one day but I'm 
Currently I'm completely red holing on some things like color output. Um, maybe, I mean, depends on, depends of course on how you define modern C++, but um, I think it's a problem that you that is almost unavoidable if you if you use a lot of, of template programming. But I mean maybe you know, you know you know ways of template programming that make intensive use of templates and don't run into this problem of a huge amount of code generated and also, I mean, what is also a problem is not only the code that you have at the end, but also the huge amount of intermediate code generated inside the C compiler or C++ compiler that makes the compiling so slow. So even if the compiler is in the end smart enough to deduplicate a lot of stuff or the linker can deduplicate a lot of stuff, uh, you still have this, um, this huge bloat in the middle. Uh, the compiler I'm using is actually not really old, so that's the, the, the Visual C++ 2019. Um, but I guess it defaults to a rather old standard, right? I did not check even. So it might be that I do not, that what I call modern C++ that does not match your definition of modern. So I wouldn't take my definition here too seriously. I must say that I also, that the formulation that I chose is intentionally controversial, let's say, because I figured that um, controversial Claims make people think about the claims. Yeah, not really an upgrade. I maybe there was a misunderstanding because I I do not use the features of the of the, of the new standards, and I think I, I don't know what what standard it defaults to. Um, but I would be surprised if it defaults to C++ 17, for example. Yeah, clickbait, that's the, that's the name of the game. Um, it is working. <laughs> you are living proof of my working clickbait. That's how low I sunk. Oh, I have sunk. Actually, I can do this now like this. Yeah, it's, it's right, it's, it's relatively trivial stuff, such a test framework. Um, I actually, as I said in my, um, in my stream, uh, where in the first part where I started to implement the test framework, there are also rather fine ones out there, like, for example, I, I liked Unity uh, quite a bit, because it's small and it fits on embedded systems and so on, and you don't have any problems with, with that, that regard. So, uh, 
but here I really wanted to take control because I mean the point of the stream for me is not only to get productive things done that is also very very important so I have a specific project in mind that I want to build up but it also should be should be a, a stream or a channel where, where people see how do you build stuff if you really build it by yourself and, and so the do-it-yourself idea is, is for me important for this channel and just today for example earlier today I, I did dive down into a crazy red hole because I cheated some code uh, just to avoid a singleton because uh, the, the, you know the C library has a very badly designed signal handler interface. You can install signal handlers, but you cannot pass any any opaque pointers to them. And I mean, I don't need to tell you that uh, for sure you know that that any well designed callback should have some kind of opaque pointer or so to to pass some data around. And uh, <laughs> today I, I cheated a stop. Um, in order to pass to my signal handler a, a pointer that I want to pass around. <laughs> it was completely crazy. Uh, it took, took quite a while to get it working because it has been a long time. First, it has been a long time since I cheated anything. And the second is I never did it on 64-bit windows with the no execute bit. So that, that took a bit of time. But it was fun. And this, this is just the kind of thing that I want to show on a channel how you can do crazy, crazy stuff like that. That actually is, I mean, if, it's, if it works and if the machine dependence is okay for you, then it's actually quite clean because you, you completely avoid uh, the dependence on any global singletons or something like this, or global variables. Okay, I'm getting a bit defocused here. What was I trying to do? I think I wanted to see how it looks like, sorry. How it looks like if the test actually passes. Uh, no, it's it's completely platform dependent. So especially machine dependent and also, I mean, indirectly, it's the stub itself is only machine dependent, um, but the way to get the memory that you can actually execute is also OS dependent. Okay, so the OK is green, which I like. Yeah, platform dependence is one of the holy cows, right? Uh, platform independence. Actually, I think it depends a lot on what you do, how important it is. And for my project, I mean, my project is planned to become um, multi-platform later. Multi-platform meaning in my case, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. Um, so no exotics. But I definitely will need POSIX POSIX style stuff later. Um, So I actually, here I could try to make a conditional format because if everything passes, I think I want this stuff to be green. I like green.
Yeah, that's a noble goal. And I think in your case, um, it also makes a lot of sense because you're working on a lot of um, open source projects, right? If I saw correctly that you that you publish and that go everywhere, probably. So It's just that platform independence, like all other things in engineering, doesn't come without a cost. And it really depends a lot on the project at which point the cost becomes too high. So. I guess I could always make the stop code here. Okay, that was wrong. Format is a null pointer, that is bad. That is bad. Of course, it's a null pointer if I pass a null, a zero, I mean, that's stupid. Okay, then have a nice evening. Bye. Thanks for dropping by. Hope to see you again. Bye. Mm. <clears throat> It's green. It is green. And we like green on this channel. So let's fail a test. Failed, fail, that is nice. Powerful. Unknown formatting code in string, that's not so good. This is actually a known formatting code. Why does it claim that this is unknown? Why, why, why? Okay, I think there's another thing I do wrong because whenever I increment P, Uh, this is actually not so nice. Ah, I know, I know, because I don't know if I know. I think I know what is the problem. And this is actually not so good. Let's do a stupid. Much too complicated calculation, but it should do the right thing.
It's working. Now let's actually print the error messages in the nice colors that we have. Should we print the whole thing or only starting with this? I'm a bit worried about these kind of escape codes. Actually, we don't have an escape mechanism now. This, I should, I should implement one. Okay, we need to put that as a prototype. And the name is bad, the name is bad. Okay, that did not, that didn't work. Why did that not work? Um, is this because this is standard error? Does it only work for standard out currently? No, that's not a problem. Ah, no, because this is This is not the problem. The problem is that I'm in the wrong in the wrong macro. No, 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 no. Yes, 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 it is red, it is a beauty, beauty, beauty. I think the running, running test, running test, running test. We can make this prettier. Let's make the cyan. I think I don't need the pointer, that's stupid. Oh, the cyan looks very much like green. 
why does the cyan look so green? Because I wrote, wrote green here. That's why the cyan looks green. Nice. Uh, actually, I think I want to print the, the names of the failing tests in red. This codes function is so convenient that I think I will use it everywhere. It is super duper convenient. <clears throat> okay, I think uh, one thing, oh, nice, one thing I, I still want to do is I probably I want to report a per test result. And then the last thing I want to look at today is I think some kind of structured exception handling because that's that's one of the main features that is still missing. Yeah, the aborted we could make red or yellow or something. So, here we should report a test result. Let's do something like this. So, um, load and result. Green, otherwise. Red. Otherwise, cyan, which I mean should not really happen, but okay. Test name. Let's see if this looks like a result reporting. Passed, failed. Very nice. Passed, blah, 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 failed. I'm liking that. 
So first for the problem statement. One thing that our test setup still doesn't do one important thing. There, there are many, many small uh, things that it doesn't do. But what it doesn't do is if we have a crash, let's, let's produce a crash. So well, let's just do So we make a memory access violation. We get this thing. And the program just exits. So this is this is not good. <clears throat> what we actually want to do is to catch this kind of access violation and report the test as failed and for this we need i think we need something called structured exception handling or windows <clears throat> so we could try something like this. Do we need to enable that or is this Let's see if this works automatically. We need to do this in the run function where we execute the stuff. Try this structured exception handling. Of course, platform and compiler dependent like hell. Um, this will need different, different solutions, different solutions on different platforms. I think here we will always do exception execute handler. And in the handler, we will definitely set the node result to failed. Actually, should we use a macro for that? Not really. Test result failed. Test failures. Yeah, this is something I don't like. This. We will need to use a, a clean function for that because because currently I have the problem that I would. I would need to increment here by hand and that's not nice. Um, we should also print some information. 
and get exception code. What, it, what does that do? Okay, we can actually only use this. Can be called only from within the filter expression or exception handler block. We are in the block, so it should work. Get is exception code. Get exception information. Yeah, this this we might want to get later. Test context. See if this compiles even. Oh, I think this is in the registry, right? Nice, nice. We can catch an exception. Actually, I think I probably want the exception to be even yellow or something. I want to. I want it to really stand out. One, two, three, four, four, six, seven. Our oh, horrible redundant. I oh, I actually promised to fix that horrible code, right? I promised you to fix that code. But first, let's see a nice yellow exception, and then I need to take a short break. Okay, we don't have this attribute. This is not a nice system here. Not very nice. But it's working. Yellow exception called by structured exception handler. Nice. So we catch except hardware exceptions. Let's try divide by zero. And we also can catch that. Let's see if the yes, 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 nice. That is looking reasonable. So Uh, 
this should be red. See you in a few minutes. Things are looking good because we are that close to actually using our new, new unit test framework for serious stuff in this project. Uh, so actually, I think what I will try is to convert the first unit test. What is the simplest one? Maybe this one, the PDF parser slow test. It has only two tests, I think. It looks quite simple. So let's make ourselves a macro test main. That is just a shorter way to, to do this here. So, bye-bye Google test, no more. Oh, the test using stuff could be a problem. Depends on what it, it needs. So this, this syntax remains the same, but This is all, all the same. Expect true remains the same. But the ex expect EQ now becomes, uh, sorry, expect EQ becomes a bit more, a bit more complicated. Okay, this is actually a float. Actually, I think it's a double. Should we use DBL or double? That is the one drawback compared to Google tests that we do not have the type magic going on. I mean, we could try to implement a bit of this type magic with some very small, simple templates. But I'm not sure that we should do it at all. So for pointers, pointers, this, these are pointers, Q pointer. Actually, I think this is more in 64. Point of difference is signed. What is the red ball? It's an int. So let's just say int 32.
No. No, 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 no. What is going on? Okay. I think that's it. We just need to implement some of these macros. So we had the double. This will need the format G, I guess. And this should be true. No, what I'm not doing all the time. This is embarrassing. Then the pointer. Pointer is P. Uh, do we need anything else? Let, let's see if we... Oh, wow, why is my video so bad? Is it really so bad? No, it's not so bad. But this is really taking a toll on my, my CPU, it seems. I have too many old windows open. The whole history of the project. So we still have to fail because we are running the wrong, the wrong test. Okay, we got some CPU problems again. Okay, we somehow got the G-test infection. Because it's, yeah, probably because it comes in via the test util. Um, okay, we need to replace no marker. Yeah, we need to test you too. But maybe... Can... For the time being... Get rid of that. It depends on Google test. So this does no longer exist, or will no longer exist. I'm not sad about that going.
This is something we need to fix later. For now, we'll just pull an assert failure. Still so many, many, many problems. Okay, test randomized. Can we... Can we salvage this? I guess not immediately. Okay, this is a problem, of course, because in our test dependencies, we do not have test.cpp. Okay, we have the signal handler twice. Uh, this actually, we will no longer need this one. This is still a bad old signal handler without the cheated stop. So let's see. Yeah, timing is also something we will do. Some timing of tests. Because this is a, this is a rather long running test, this round trip test. Passed, nice. That's why it's called PDF parser slow test. It's not promising too much. Nice. Green two test of two past. Ladies and gentlemen, that was our first unit test using the new framework. It's so nice. I guess let's do another one. Okay, this will be a bit... This already uses the randomization. I think I will do that tomorrow. Because that's, that's not actually building up, the work to do is not, not really building up the unit test framework so much. It is more porting the extensions we did to Google test over to our own framework. So these extensions, the randomized memory, this will be much easier in our own framework actually.
I wonder if it will be so easy if it will be so easy as to be almost sure not quite I think because the fixture stuff the fixture stuff is something that I'm not sure if I actually want it in my new framework but currently the tests rely a bit on the fixture stuff so in order to conclude today's session so let's not dive into that yet but let's try some sensitivity tests let's inject some problems Um, for example, let's just flip a bit in result. I'm too tired for Vim. Just to see if we. Oh, yeah, we got many errors. Fail, 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 fail. Okay, so that is working. It's just a lot of output to deal with. Uh, but let's try instead if we do here an assert. So this should be this should immediately terminate the test. Okay, we get this debug opportunity and then it terminates the test. Yeah, failed about it. Yeah, it's working. Our new framework is working. And due to the one or two red holes that we dived in, it's maybe not as far along as I would have hoped it to be this um, for tonight. But we already have one unit test running on the new framework. So probably tomorrow, I don't know if I will be able to stream tomorrow. Next time, definitely we will move the rest of our tests to the new framework and we will have much nicer compilation times. And everything will be colorful and pretty. <laughs> 